Okay, unit three, sampling and experimental design. So we will learn how to do the sampling in unit number three. Sampling, we have seen that the reason for collecting data from a sample is to get some idea about the population that the sample presents. So there are two words they are using. One word they're using is population. What is population? Population is collection of all of the objects or people. Collection of all of the objects of people. And what is sample? Sample is a small portion taken from the population. So two words we're going to use. One is population and one is sample. Population is entire population means collection of all of the items, all of the objects. And sample is a small object or small portion of things that are taken from the population. So we have seen that the reason for collecting data from a sample is to get some idea about the population that the sample represents. Unit, until now, we have usually assumed that the samples from which we measure variables are representative of the whole population. So what is the meaning of this line? The samples from which we measure the variables are representative of whole population. The meaning of this line, it means that if we have a population, for example, what is a population? Students of uni students studying in the university. Studying in university. In ABC means any university name of the university okay so what will be the sample i cannot examine every student studying in the university because there are a lot of students so i will take one student from each department one student from each department so then i will study one student from each department or examine one student from each department which will represent the entire population the entire department so it means samples from which we measure variables we take the sample sample is one student from each department they represent the entire population the whole population that is studying in that university okay so okay. there are two things one is population one is sample now sampling However, this may not be the case always. We need to pay careful attention to the way we collect our samples in order to make them useful, representative of the population which we wish to examine. Okay, so a local newspaper publishes the following survey. Do you think marijuana should be legalized? It lists a phone number to call to vote yes and other number to vote no. The next day, they print results. A total of 1193 people responded to the surveys and 83% voted yes, while 17% voted no. The paper writes an additional editorial using as evidence to appeal the government to legalize the currently illegal drug. Is anything wrong in the survey? The process of collecting data from a sample to make statement about population is called sampling. The sampling method used in the previous example is called voluntary response sampling. So what is sampling? The process of collecting data from a sample to make the statement about the population. Now there was a very big population in, in a country and the newspaper wants to know that do the marijuana should be legalized or not. So they just called 1193 people. They call only 1193 people. So this 1193 people is called the sample. They answered, either some answered yes and some answered no. So there are, it was a lot of population, but they called only 1193 people. So this is a sample. So sampling is basically a few people from the population. So in this case, when every person, every person of the sample is called individually, then that kind of sampling is called voluntary response sampling. Voluntary means every person is called individually. Voluntary response sample, such a sample consists of people who choose to include themselves into the sample by represent, responding to a question or survey. The random, the problem with this type of sampling is that the data represents the opinion of people who feel strongly about the subject in the question. So now what is voluntary response sampling? Now there are many types of sampling. The number one type of sampling is voluntary response sampling. What is voluntary response sampling in which there is a question or a survey? And every person in the sample is asked a question in the survey and they give a, a response or an answer to that question or a survey. So whenever there is a response from the people, it is called voluntary response sampling. So this is the first type of sampling that we have studied. Okay. Voluntary well, response sampling. People who feel strongly about marijuana use are likely those who think it should be legalized. Those in favor of chance 
change often feel more passionately than those in favor of keeping things the same. Someone who is happy with the way things are is not likely to take the time to call in and answer a survey question. And a few people will not answer the survey question. So this is what happened in voluntary response sampling. As such, these results are obviously not representative of the opinions of the general public. In reality, the percentage of people favoring the legalization of marijuana is much lower. Voluntary response samples are almost always unreliable and should be avoided if possible. So why the voluntary response sampling is unreliable? Because we asked only a few number of people, like if there are one lakh people, we asked only 1100 people. So we asked very few people. Secondly, the response is if a person is much likely to take marijuana, he will say yes. And if a person does not like, he will say no. And if a person does not have time, he can not respond to the call. So it means it is not the general public opinion. It is just their personal wish that if they like it or not like it. Secondly, it is a very small number of people who we are calling and asked. So voluntary response sampling has some disadvantages. So it is not much reliable. It is an unreliable sampling. This is important. This is an unreliable sampling. Okay. Up until now, we have assumed that the data come from a good sample. We see now that we must examine the sampling method used before we can generalize our conclusions to the problem. If we are selecting the sample ourselves, then we must do so in a way that enables us to do the sample data to make reliable statements about the entire population. So sample should be taken very effectively because sample represents a statement about the entire population. So if we don't have a good sample, we will not get a good statement about our population. Are you understanding, Abdullah? If there is any problem, you can ask me. I understand. Let's take the example. A research company is conducting a survey at local shopping malls asking shoppers about their buying habits. So they are asking the shoppers that how, what are their buying habits. The company would like to know if consumers have changed their spending behavior since the recent decline in the economy, an employee of the company select shoppers and ask them to respond to the survey. Convenience sample. This is called a convenience sample. This type of sample chooses individuals who are easiest to reach. The surveyor is more likely to ask friendly looking people to respond to the questionnaire. Now they are, the person wants to ask the questions to the people and they are looking at the people who are more friendly or looking more reliable they're asking that people the questions so the sample in which we choose individuals on our own is called convenient sampling convenient sampling is going to a mall and serving people who seem easy to approach certainly make things easier for the research firm and the employee but it makes the sample virtually useless this sample is supposed to represent all consumers, but it really represents those who are already shopping. And so spending behaviors will appear higher and all those who seem more friendly. So convenience sampling views the sample people who are already, already in the mall, already in the shopping mall. So it means they are already shopping and they are more friendly. So the sample is basically restricted. Sampling buys. Both voluntary response samples and convenience samples are biased. The design of a study is biased if it systematically favors certain outcomes over the others. So what is the meaning of biasedness? If certain outcomes are favored, if there is a favorism, favoritism, we can say now the teacher favor, favorism any one student on the other. So if it is a favorism in the sampling, then that is called sampling biased. So the, both of the convenience sampling and the voluntary response sampling are the biased sampling. The solution for the bias type of samples we have seen is to choose our samples in a way that neither the sample nor the respondents choose the sample units. We will choose the sample by chance that is in a way that does not favor any of the potential units. Choosing the sample in the manner attacks biases by giving all individuals, men, women, which poor, young, old, black, white, and equal chance of being selected. So if we will just choose the sample by chance like we will just go somewhere and by chance we will just choose the sample then that will be the most good sample but if we will choose a sample specifically from one area that won't be the what won't be the sample that contains all kind of individuals so what is simple random sampling this is another type of sampling 
The easiest way to choose a sample is to put names in a hat and to choose n of them. This is the framework behind simple random sampling. It means if we have 100 peoples, if we have 100 peoples, we put the name of 100 peoples in a box and find out any 10. So there is no favoritism that if they are shopping in a mall or not, if they are rich or poor, if they are men or women, they, we will just simply find out any 10. So this is called simple random sampling. An outcome is called random it if, has, if it has two or more possible values with the non-probability of being observed. A simple random sample of size n consists of n individuals from the population chosen in such a way that every group of n individuals has an equal chance to be the sample actually selected. It follows that each individual has an equal chance of being selected. Obviously, if we have 100 people in a box, so if we take out any five, so every person has equal chance of being selected. So in the simple random sampling, it is also called SRS. You should know the abbreviation too. It is called SRS, means simple random sampling. So every individual has equal chance of being selected. Okay. So this is about simple random sampling in which we can select any number of people and every person has equal chance of being selected. Now we are going to read about the next sampling type that is called systematic sampling. Systematic sampling is a sampling method in which samples are selected by numbering each number of the population and then selecting every kth number. Systematic sampling involves a random start and then proceeds with the selection of every kth element from the then words. K can be used as n element. Example, selecting every 15th person on a list of the population like telephone directory. So if I have a tele, if you, are, you, are, you have a context, the context are A, 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 B, A, C, B, B, B. And what you are going to do, you have to select every 15th number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 15th number you will select. Then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 15th number you will select. So in this way, if you select every 15th person, every 10th person, every second person, then that type of sampling is called systematic sampling. Okay. Select a sample of size 10 from a population below using systematic sampling. Okay. So how you will do? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So you will select this. Then again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You will select this. Then again, 10, you will select this. So you will select every 10th number, every 10th element, or every 10th person that is called systematic sampling. Okay, so what are the benefits or disadvantages? Systematic sampling is easier to perform than simple random sampling. Obviously, it is easier because we know we have to select fifth number or 10th number or 100th number. So even the softwares can do this. If we're in the software, we can try to select every 10th number or every 100th number and they can just do it. So this is easier to perform. However, if there are product patterns within the data set, the sample will be biased. In systematic sampling, each individual has an equal chance of being selected into the sample. So also in the systematic sampling, there is an equal chance of being selected. Also in the simple random sampling, there is an equal chance of being selected. However, every possible group of individuals in the population do not have the same chance of being chosen. For example, samples with at least two elements adjacent to each other will never be chosen by systematic sampling. Okay, so next is stratified random sampling. So we are studying now third type of sampling that is called system stratified random sampling. A simple random sample gives each unit in the population an equal chance of being selected, but this isn't the case for all sampling methods. Sometimes our population is naturally divided into groups of similar individuals. Suppose we wish to conduct a survey asking Canadians what their disposable income is. Different provinces have different levels of income and taxation. So it is natural to divide the country into 13 strata, 10 provinces, 3 territories. A stratum is a group of similar individuals. So what is stratum? Stratified random sampling, stratified, the word comes from the stratified, it is called strata. Strata means group of similar people. So sometimes our sample contains group of similar people. So it means if we have a Canadian 
and we have to ask the people of Canada. So we will, uh, they can be divided into different provinces. So each province is one strata. So there will be 13 strata. Within each of the strata, we take an SRS of equal side. What is SRS? What is SRS? Certified. Yes. Certified random sampling. Simple random sampling. Simple. I just told you that you should know the abbreviation. What is SRS? Simple random sampling. Now, in stratified random sampling, what will happen? That first of all, we have a Canada. We have to select people of Canada. But we will divide them into 13 different states. State 1, state 2, state 3, state 4, 5, 6, 13 different states. Now, we will pick people from every state through simple random sampling. Like, we will pick one people, three people from here, three from here, three from here. This is called stratified random sampling. In simple random sampling, what will happen? If we have this Canada, we will just go and pick 10 people from anywhere. But in stratified random sampling, first we will divide them into strata, into different states, into different categories, and then we will select the people from each category using simple random sampling. So this is the main difference between simple random and stratified sampling. Note that our total sample is not an SRS, means simple random sampling. Not every possible group of any individuals in the population. Okay. Not every possible group of any individuals in the population has the same chance of being chosen. In addition, not even every individual has the same chance of being chosen unless the sample size in each province is proportional to this population size. So what will happen if the Canada has... 10, uh, 13 states, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Maybe the first state has 1,000 people, second state has 4,000 people, third state has 10,000 people, but we are going to choose only two persons from every state. So it means that if, every, if the sample size in each province is not proportional to the population size, then there is not equal chance of being chosen from every province, right? Because every yeah. state have different number of population, so it's not equal chance of choosing from each province. Randomization would have ensured that we get a diverse sample among the provinces. But in this setting, certification is even better as we not only ensure that we get the scenario of diversification, but we can also select how many units we want from each group. Okay, the next type of sampling is multi-state sampling. Suppose a polling firm, now read the word multi-state. It will help you understand the sampling. Suppose a polling firm would like to conduct a door-to-door -door survey of urban Canadians, asking their opinions on the environment. If it, it is not realistic to select an SRS of N people to go survey. What is SRS now? Simple random sampling. Yes. So now they cannot do the simple random sampling to survey every people. This would cost too much. Instead, we may wish to select a simple random sample of Canadian cities. Then we select a simple random sample of neighborhood in each selected city. Then we select a simple random sample of blocks of the houses in each selected neighbors. And then we survey the accountants of the households. So you understand what they're doing? They do it in multi-state. Yeah. Now, let me tell you, this type of sampling is called multi-state sampling. What is the multi-stage? Again, this type of sampling does not produce an SRS, 
not every combination of unit has a chance of being selected. Not every household will have the chance of being included either, unless we carefully design the sample to make this happen. So what did they do it? They cannot go door to door and choose every person and survey every person. So they have to divide the all the Canada, uh, Canada all the Canada into cities. Then they divide all the cities into neighborhood. Then they divide all the neighborhood into blocks. And then they, uh, then they select a few people from each block and then they survey them. So when we are doing the grouping, cities, then neighborhoods, then blocks, the grouping is called stages, stage one, stage two, stage three. Therefore, it is called multi-stage sampling. The name indicates the sampling. There will be stages in the sampling that is called multi-stage sampling. While stratified random sampling can be viewed as more powerful than an SRS, a multi-stage sample is not quite as good as an SRS. It is often our only option though, subject to time to cost and restraints, it should be noted. However, these types of samples can serve our purpose very well in, if conducted properly. So they are saying that multi-stage sampling is very effective on time and cost. So if they ask you in the question yet which type of sampling is more effective for time and cost, it means the multi-stage sampling is more effective for time and cost. Okay, so the types of sampling that we have studied are listed over here. Voluntary sampling, in which we have to volunteer every person, we can call them or we can ask every person. Convenient sampling, simple random sampling, stratified sampling, multi-stage sampling. These are the sampling tests we have studied up till now. What is census? Collection of data from every individual in the entire population. Census is what happened, what census just happened in the last month in Pakistan. So census is what happened uh, a few years after, every few years it happens in every country. So what is census? It's the collection of data from every individual. The, the people of the government come to every house and ask every individual about the population. Okay, even a carefully designed sample can be collected in a non-random fashion. A group of lobbyists supposed to in Hanitia, which is to disagree the government from legalizing assisted suicide in Canada. A telephone survey is conducted respondents from all walks of life included in the sample, men and women, young, old, with different backgrounds and incomes. Leading question. The question asked is as follows. Should it be legal to kill a living human at any stage of his or her life? Not surprisingly, 33% of respondents said no. The group represented its findings to the government saying the current law with the support of 93% of Canadians must be kept. The flaws in the, this conclusion are obvious. The results were obtained using a leading question. So sometimes what happened that we have to take a question and then we make a few people to answer that question and that question results us in the sampling. The wording of questions is only one thing that can influence the respondent. The tone or brevity of the interviewer as well as the interviewer's race or gender often biases a respondent's answer. In addition, the respondent may be unable to recall the information to respond requested, making his or her answer a guess. Often the person being surveyed will also lie or avoid unwavering, unflattering opinions or behaviors. So what happens? This may be sometimes they not give a good answer for the sampling question. Non-response or under coverage. Two other problems. So what are the two problems that come when we ask a leading question? Non-response occurs when respondents refuse to answer the question. This is the case within many phone surveys. People hang up, not wanted to bother. So you know sometimes it happens that a phone call comes from the government. We just attend the phone call and we do not answer them and we just hang up the phone call because we don't want to answer them. Under coverage. Mm -hmm. Results when some units in the population have no chance of being included in the sample. For example, phone surveys ex exclude a certain percentage of the population. Those without phones. So some of the people do not have phones. So some of the people we cannot cover because they don't have phone or they cannot be listed. Sampling. Important things to remember in selecting a good sample. Select the sample in an unbiased and representative manner, proper interviewing trainer, good non-leading, easy to understand wording, and try to make non-responsive and a non-issue question. So we should not make a question that has an issue. 
or that has that do not have any response and it should have a very easy and good wording. Important things to remember is selecting a good sample. Include all population units in your possible sample. Voluntary response and convenience samples are not appropriate. If you can do something better than SRS, do it. Make the sample more representative of the population. So what is our main target? To make the sample more representative of the population. That our sample should be representative of entire population. This is the most important thing. Experimental design. We have seen in several examples that an observational study does not allow us to establish the cause of an observed difference in the value of some response variable for different groups. Recall that an observational study simply measures variable on an individual while an experiment deliberately imposes some treatment on an individual in order to observe their response to the treatment. Recall the coffee and the sleep example. Does the caffeine in coffee really help keep you awake? Researchers interviewed 300 adults and asked them how many cups of coffee they drink on an average day, as well as how many hours of sleep they get at night. So how many coffees they drink and how many sleep they get. We reasoned that even if those who drink more coffee get less sleep, we cannot say that coffee is the cause. Maybe a subject's high stress level is what causes him more or less sleep. We don't know. Stress level is said to be confounded with the amount of coffee a person drinks. Two variables are said to be confounded when I am. Experimental design. In experimental design, we have some additional vocabulary. <clears throat> The individuals on which the experiment is performed are called experimental units. If the individuals are people, they are called subjects. A specific set of experimental conditions applied to the units is called a treatment. So we have read three new vocabulary words, experimental units. What is the experimental units? The individuals on which the experiment is performed is called experimental units. If the individuals, if we perform the experiment of the people, then those people are called subjects. And the specific set of experiment conditions applied to the unit is called a treatment. The purpose of an experiment is to observe the response of one or more variables to change in other variables. And so the distinction between explanatory and response variable is necessary. So there are two variables. One is explanatory variable and one is response variable. What is explanatory variable that gives us the explanation? And what is response variable that gives us a response about any explanation that we are asking? The explanatory variables in an experiment are called factors, and the different values of the factors are called factor levels. The combination of factor levels of all variables actually applied to a unit is called a treatment. So what is treatment? All the factor levels applied to only one variable is called a treatment. Let's take the example. The effectiveness of the three laundry detergents is being compared. So we have three laundry detergents, A, B, and C, and we will compare the effective names. Nine white sheets are each stained with grape juice, motor oil, and mustard. So there are nine sheets, and all have the stains of the grape juice, motor oil, and mustard. Three sheets will be each be washed in uh, with tire detergent. Three will be washed with cheese. Three will be washed with the tire detergent. Three will be washed with the cheese detergent. And the remaining three will be washed with the sunlight detergent. So there are three detergents and three sheets will be used with to wash three of them. The sheets will be randomly assigned which detergent they will be washed with. And all of them will be washed in the same washing machine. After they are washed, the amount of stains removed all will be compared for all of the detergents. There, This is an experiment. Okay, so you know what is an experiment? There were three detergents, A, B, C, for example. There were nine bed sheets and there were three sheets were used to wash with three detergents in the same washing machine. So this is an experiment. Okay. The response variable is stains removed. So what is the response of this experiment? That either stains are removed or not, or either stains are completely removed or completely not removed. The experiment units, what are the experiment units? The sheets are the experiment units. There is only one factor, brand of the detergents. How many factors are there? There is only one factor that there are three brands of the detergent. There are three levels of the factors, star, cheer, and sunlight. Since there is only one factor in this experiment, the treatment are the same as the factor level. So this is an example of the experiment, factors, and the... Okay. 
Nutritionists would like to simultaneously study the effect of diet and exercise on the weight loss of overweight adults. So some people are overweighted. Nutritionists would study uh, effect of diet and exercise at the same time. Simultaneously means at, at the same time. They would like to examine the effect of two different diets, Atkins and Weight Watchers. The three exercise programs, running, cycling, and swimming. A total of 120 overweight adults volunteered to participate in the experiment. So what is an experiment? There are 120 people. They are overweighted. They, the nutritionist is going to give them the diet and the exercise. Exercises can be cycling, swimming, or running. So in this way, he, the nutritionist will examine that what is the weight loss. So the response variables in this experiment is weight loss. So what are they working for? They're working for weight loss. So whatever thing you are working for is called the response variable. Are you understanding why weight loss is the response variable? Yeah. Okay. The experiment units are volunteers. So the people who are doing the experiments is called the experiment units. So now they will ask you what is the experiment units? The volunteers are the experiment units. There are two factors, diet and exercise program. So in the last example, there was only one factor that was detergent. But in this example, there are two factors. One is the diet and one is the exercise. Diet has two factor levels, Atkins and Weight Watchers. Exercise has three factor levels, running, swimming, and cycling. So these are the things that will be asked you in your questions. The number one thing yeah. will be response variable, experiment units, factors, and factor level, and exercise program has three factor levels. As such, there are two into three is equal to six treatments shown below. So diet, Factor levels. If the factor level is Atkins or Weight Watchers, factor levels can be running, swimming, or cycling. So we have a table like this. Factor levels here and factor levels here. So treatment one, treatment two, three, four, five, six. So in this way, we can make a chart. Experimental design. These examples illustrate the advantage of conducting an experiment rather than an observational study. In the first example, since the sheets are all equally dirty to start out with, and since they are washed in the same washing machine, any difference in the amount of stains removed must be due to the detergent. So in the first example, there was only one factor that is detergent, right? So if there is a stain left on the sheet, if there is a stain left on the sheet, it will be due to the detergent use because there was only one factor. So this factor will be involved in the response variable. Are you getting it? But in yeah. the second example, in the second example, since subjects are randomly assigned to the treatment, the treatment groups should be relatively homogeneous with respect to one another prior to the experiment. Each treatment group will contain individuals with a variety of characteristics, some with good diet, some with bad diet, some with smoke, some who do not smoke, some male and some female. So there, then if there is a significant difference in weight loss among the groups, we can conclude it was because of the treatment of those individuals received. So in the second example, there are six treatment groups. So you can see you have one, two, three, four, five, six treatment groups. So each treatment group have different type of people. Some will have diet. We know if some people are following Atkins diet, but we don't know if it will be good or very good or bad or very bad or if they are smokers or non-smokers. So in the second experiment, we will just find out the results and then we will indicate that how, what kind of people uh, are taking what kind of diet plan and what kind of exercises. Interaction. Another advantage of experiments is that we can simultaneously examine the effect of several variables on the response variable. This will enable us to examine any interaction that might be present among the factors. So now we will learn about that there is some interaction between the factors available. Suppose an individual suffers from both anxiety and high blood pressure. So there is an individual who suffers from both anxiety. The, the individual have two problems. Problem number one is anxiety. Problem number two is high blood pressure. If we conduct separate experiments, we might find this which medication is the most effective at treatment anxiety and which is most effective for treatment of high blood pressure. However, when taken all together, the medications might interact and cause an adverse reaction. This is why it is important to examine the effects of both factors simultaneously in one experiment. So in this experiment, we have to take both of the factors, anxiety and high blood pressure at one time. 
because it may happen that we are giving the medicine for anxiety, but it does not maintain the blood pressure. And if we give the medicine for blood pressure, it does not maintain anxiety. So we have to consider both the factors at one time. So in few examples, we have to take both the, in, in both the factors at one time that is called infection. Not that it is usually not possible to select the experiment units randomly. This is especially true in the case of the human subjects. The mo most volunteer to participate in the experiment, even though they are not selected randomly, what is important is that we can view them in respective representative of the population they come from. In other words, the fact that they are volunteers shouldn't make them any more or less likely to respond to a treatment. The detergent example is the simplest case of an experiment. We get this unit, apply the treatment, and observe the results. We always try to control the environment to eliminate the effect of any potential lurking variables. So we, in the last unit, we also learned about the lurking variables. Lurking variables are the variables which do have effect in our experiment, but we are not considering them in our experiment. The comparison of treatment is a leading principle in experimental design. For a comparison to be legitimate, the groups receiving each treatment must be similar with respect to all other variables. Experimental design. How can we ensure that treatment groups are similar with respect to one another? We assign the individuals to the treatments randomly. Groups formed by randomization don't depend on any characteristics of the units. Our goal is for the only distinction between treatment groups to be treatment they are receiving. Completely randomized de design. A special type of experiment is a design in which all units are randomly assigned to receive the various treatments. We call such an experiment a completely randomized design, CRD. Both examples we have seen are for CRD. So what is CRD? Completely randomized design. Experimental design. We can draw a diagram to illustrate the design of an experiment. Nine sheets. Okay, we have just done this experiment. There were nine sheets. We randomly allocate group one, group two, and group three. We randomly allocate three sheets to each group. Then we give one treatment to each sheet, and then we compare all the stains are removed or not. So this is a diagram we can make for the experimental design. Now see. There are 120 people who are overweighted. We randomly allocate group 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 20 people in each group. Then we give the treatment and then we compare the weight loss. Are you getting it? Yeah. Okay. Patients who have had back pain for over a year go to see a chiropractor for spine manipulation to ease their pain. After one week of treatment, 86% of patients report that their pain is either gone or in decline. Does this mean that the spine manipulation has cured their pain? No, we don't know. We can't tell if the elimination of the pain is because something helpful is being done or because the patient perceives something helpful is being done. This is called placebo effect. Placebo is dummy treatment that is known to have no physical effect. It may, however, have beneficial psychological effect. Control group. A proper way to reach a conclusion in this case would be I randomly divide the patients into two groups. One group would receive proper spine manipulation techniques while the other may simply receive some sort of back manipulation that is known as ineffective. This is known as control loop group, one for which the treatment is done and one for which the treatment is not done. We can use the control groups in our experiments to eliminate the possibility that an observed change is due to something other factor than being studied. In this example, it may turn out that a high percentage of first patients receiving the ineffective back manipulation report a decrease in pain. If, however, the percentage is much higher for the treatment group than the control group, we can conclude that it was in fact the spine manipulation that causes a decrease in the pain. So what has happened is a control group, we take two groups and for the one group, we do a proper treatment. For the one group, we just manipulate and then we see what are the results. A group of patients suffering from an anxiety disorder is prescribed a new pill, which they take for one year. So now a new pill or a new medicine is introduced and the group of people who are suffering from anxiety will take that medicine. At the end of the year, most of the patients report a decrease in the anxiety. So at the end of the year, we will see if the people 
with the anxiety there is a decrease or not this may be because the pill is working or it may be because other things in their life has become less stressful it may also be because they think the pill should be helping or and so they perceive it to be doing so so what happened there should be two factors either the pill is actually working or the people just think that pill is working and they get out of the stress do you understand this thing either you know you have prepared all you need to and you can do the quiz to 100 percent or either you just think that you you can do it 100 percent and you will make it 100 percent okay so one thing is that we think and one thing is we actually did we may want to randomly divide our originate sample into two and give one of the group the actual medication and other group a placebo what is placebo or sugar pill placebo means it is not the actual medicine like we will just give the patient a medicine that is actually not a medicine but patient will think that it is a medicine patient will think that they because they are eating the medicine therefore they are getting out of the stress but actually we are just giving them some sugar pills and that is not the medicine we compare stress level of the two groups after one year and if the pill group groups stress has decreased significantly more than that of the placebo groups we can say pill is working all other potential lurking variables have been eliminated and the only systematic difference between the groups is the type of the medication so now did you understand what is the meaning of placebo group yeah what is the meaning of placebo now uh it's just a psychological thing just to yes. make the patient so think it works but it doesn't given. This is just something that the people think that they are given, but actually it is not given. Okay. Any medication which is actually not given. Okay. Suppose you are taking the Pepsi challenge. A Pepsi employee places two cups on a table, one containing Coke and another Pepsi. The labels for each cup are behind the cups, but are hidden for view and not biased your response. Your taste uh, both colas and select which you prefer. The design of the experiment is fine from the tester's point of view. She has no idea which cola is which. However, the worker at the both who works for Pepsi does know which cup contains which cola. As such, his works and actions may in some way persuade a tester to select Pepsi over Coke double blind experiment so this is called double blind experiment what is double blind experiment one way to avoid this problem is to perform a double blind experiment one in which neither the subject nor the person administrating the treatment knows which treatment is the one being applied at any time as such the experiment is made more legitimate in that the bias introduced the, by the worker knowing which cup contains the pepsi is eliminated an experiment is said to be biased when the methodology and systematically favors certain outcomes replication just as in the case for the area of statistics sample size is an important factor in the experimental design if an experiment is performed on more units the our results will be more trustworthy Obviously, we know if we take more units for the experiment, the results will be more well, more uh, worthfully. Replication is the administration of each treatment to more than one unit. Replication means that we are doing the same treatment, not only on one unit, but on more than one unit. We perform the same experiment on more than one unit. That is called replication. Experimental design. We have seen the three important principles of experimental design, randomization, control, and replication. What is randomization? The experiment used to the various treatments control that we take two, two different groups and then control one by lurking variable or one by placebo and other by actual medication. Replication that we perform the results again, experiment again and again. So there are three experimental designs. Blocking. A completely randomized design, as we mentioned, is the simplest type of design. Each treatment is assigned to a random sample of available subjects. We may attempt to further ensure the exclusion of the effect of lurking variables by using the principle of blocking. A block is a group of experiment units or subjects that are similar in ways that are expected to affect the response to the treatments. In the randomized block design, the random assignment of treatment to units is carried out separately within each block. So what is random block design? That we take random blocks, we random blocks of people, and then we put out the experiment for each of the block. Randomly select the people from each block and then put the experiment for each block. So there is an example for this. A researcher would like to compare the effectiveness of two popular anti anti tablets. 
terms and rulets. Terms and rulets are two tablets, and the researcher wants to compare the effectiveness. 300 people suffering from the acid reflux disease volunteered to participate in the study. The researcher believes that the response to the two medications may differ depending on the survey of the disease, and so he decides to conduct the experiment separately for one into volunteers and with moderate acid reflux disease and for 120 with severe acid reflux disease. This is another form of the control. It ensures that some of each type of the patient is getting each tablet. A control group is also included, giving the third of the volunteer as a placebo, a similar looking a tablet known as which has no medical effect. So there he makes three groups, one with less effect of the acid reflux, one with more effect of the acid reflux, and one giving the placebo, which is not a medicine which is has no medical effect. So mild acid reflux, weird acid reflux, random experiment, there are few groups, treatment, and we compared the effectiveness. The blocking variable in this case is variety of acid reflux route. Notice that the blocks are not found randomly. We purposely divide. So we purposely divide the volunteers into two groups in the mild and sphere. It's not that it was actually divided, but we do divide them to check the effectiveness of the results. So this is 300 volunteers and we divide them into block one and block two with mild and severe and then we do take the groups and treatment to compare the effectiveness. Notice that in the above experiment, the researchers wanted to compare the two antacid tablets and to determine if either of them were, was better than a placebo. Also, they were going, giving placebo to a third group. So they checked at which one is better, either any of the antacid tablet or a placebo. Randomized block design. Suppose in the weight loss example, in that the nutritionists believe males and females might respond differently to different diet and exercise programs, they may wish to inst instead use a randomized block design, where gender is a blocking variable. They can then conduct the experiment separately for men and women. So lastly, we read an example for the nutritionist who for the weight loss thing. Now, the nutritionist can also do the same experiment by dividing males and uh, females separately. So males and females of the general will be the blocking line. Summary of good experimental design. Allocate units to treatment randomly. Control the effect of possible lurking variables. Use the principle of replication to each apply of the treatment. Summary of good experimental design. Draw a diagram that we have just drawn for each of the experiment. Eliminate the biasness and remember the placebo effect. Experimental design. Use a randomized block design if some units are similar with respect to the other units. Remember that the purpose of an experiment is to avoid confounding and to establish transposition. Any confusion up till now? No.